This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. We begin with USDA Kansas State Director for Rural Development, Christy Davis, for a conversation on programs available for rural communities through the USDA. Also ahead, what meaning is there really behind a name? For the K-State Legacy Sale taking place on March 3rd, Legacy tells the sale story in more ways than one. Joining me to talk about the Legacy Sale is K-State Faculty Advisor for the Purebred Beef Unit, Chris Mullenix, and K-State Purebred Beef Unit Manager, Shane Work. They share insight on the history of the sale, the one-of-a-kind learning opportunity for students, and what buyers can expect to see this year. We end with this week's Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook, highlighting that fly season is just around the corner, and that cleaning up breeding grounds on the farm now can help reduce fly problems later on. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are joined now by the Kansas State Director for USDA Rural Development. Her name is Christy Davis, and she's joining us today to talk through some of the USDA's programs and focuses really going on when it comes to the world of rural development in our state. So like I said, there's going to be several subjects that we talk about today, but the first one we really wanted to focus on was the REAP programming available to Kansas. So tell us a bit about that program. Yeah, Rural Energy for America program. It's a program that's been around a while uh, at USDA Rural Development, but there have been some enhancements to the program under the Inflation Reduction Act. This is designed to enhance energy efficiency with rural small businesses and ag producers. And I think historically, ag producers have known about the program and taken advantage of it. I'm really interested in working as well with rural small businesses, and that's businesses in communities that are a population under 50,000, which of course is most communities in Kansas. The program provides loan guarantees for up to 75% of eligible costs for making energy efficiency enhancements. So a lot of folks use the funding to put solar panels on their businesses, or sometimes we're working with rural grocery stores and they're changing out inefficient refrigeration systems or HVAC systems. So going from systems that are inefficient and making them more efficient, if you have an energy savings, then that's something that you may qualify for for the REIT program. With the Inflation Reduction Act that passed here at the end of 2022, an additional $2 billion was allocated for this program over the next 10 years. So we're going to be able to kind of deploy some of that additional funding to really help rural businesses in Kansas tackle some of these challenges with energy efficiency. There's also a grant component to this program, and historically, it's been grants up to 25% of the qualified project costs. That, with the enhancements that were made under the Inflation Reduction Act, that will increase from 25% to 40%. So there's an enhancement there that may be enough to encourage additional folks to apply. So we're really excited about this increase in funding because this is a program that we have a lot of demand for. I think nationwide, for every successful applicant, there have been a lot of other applicants. It's been pretty competitive in the past, not necessarily in Kansas, but nationwide. This will allow us to really Really address those needs for the communities and businesses that want to apply. Well, it sounds like a great opportunity, especially when you mentioned, you know, the opportunity for rural grocers to apply for this grant and access that money and utilize it in ways to support their communities. We do a lot of work with that here at K-State revolving around yeah. rural grocery stores and the significance of their role and what they do for their communities. So yeah, a great opportunity for those businesses for sure. Very interested in the work that K-State's been doing. In fact, we recently awarded a $175,000 grant to K-State's Rural Grocery Initiative. So pretty proud to play a small part in that project. We also, with our REAP program, there's a K-State connection in that K-State historically has been involved in helping with the energy audits that are required as part of the REAP program. So we have a partnership there as well, and that's been a good relationship over time. So K-State's done a great job of partnering with us to really get these programs out to the communities that need it. Excellent. Yeah, I had no idea that we played such a role in the REAP program, specifically with audits and things. That's amazing. It is 
was amazing. Yeah, we're <laughs> learning something new every day. It's wonderful. So <laughs> the next subject we really wanted to focus on is obviously the USDA has all of these amazing grant programs, but sometimes there's a hard disparity between these rural communities actually accessing or utilizing those funds because there's a lack in numbers, right? I couldn't agree more. I live in a town of 900. I live in Cottonwood Falls, Kansas. And like many, many, many communities, we don't have a city manager, let alone someone whose job it is to apply for all the funding that's available. And it does have an impact. With federal programs, even, if we're defining rural as 50,000 and under, larger communities have the capacity to access these programs. And sometimes it gives them an advantage over the smaller communities just simply because they don't have people with the time or technical expertise or knowledge to access them. And, you know, I've been on the job since early July, so I'm still pretty new like you. Part of my job is making people aware of them, but I fully understand that many of our communities have challenges accessing them. And the places where these policies are made aren't often places that really understand how rural communities work on the ground, and they may not really understand some of the challenges there are in applying. So, What I would encourage folks to do who are interested in pursuing this is go out, do some research, check us out at usda.gov, the rural development programs in particular, and see what's available. But also the reason that we have folks on the ground in Kansas is that we want you to communicate with us. Let us help you. You know, contact us. Tell us about your proposed projects so that we can help you navigate the application processes. We know it's not easy especially for rural communities that just you know, may not have the capacity. The challenge we face is those are the communities that need our programs the most. We have a great staff person actually in our Newton office who's been helping with the REIT program in particular. And we have other folks throughout the state, but principally out of our Topeka office, who can help facilitate that. There is also, I think, an emphasis in rural development nationwide to really be helping as a field operation, similar to what FSA does on the production ag side, to really help people through these processes. Because if it was easy, everybody would do it. A lot of our programs are financing programs or secured financing. And I'll tell you, the communities who are you know sticking their necks out and really going after those types of funds and understand that they have to prime the pump. You know, they have to invest in their community's future. We work with folks who are doing, you know, great things, community building, all kinds of projects like that. And sometimes that means, you know, taking out some financing. With interest rates increasing, we can provide some competitive rates. So some of our programs are financing. Whenever we can assist with grant money, we are happy to do it. We understand, though, that one of the challenges that these communities face is they don't always have the tax base to have the money in the bank to match or even sometimes to pay for the engineering to design a project that they can then apply for funding from us for. So those are some of the challenges that we see in communities. The ones that I see succeeding are ones where there's, you know, engaged people who have the time or are working with grant folks, usually not internally, but they have somebody who helps them navigate these funding sources or are willing to invest for the future in part through uh, financed projects, in particular hospitals and, you know, community facilities, childcare, those types of projects. We want to help. We understand that there are some barriers and we may even have some ideas for you for overcoming those so you can access our programs and that they can work in your community. Absolutely. Sometimes some of these things, like you mentioned, it takes a village almost. It has to be a community effort because in a lot of ways, like you said, there's a lot of work behind the scenes that goes into these applications and even the work afterwards. It's not like you receive the grant or the loan and it's done. It's a follow up and follow through with that. And that requires additional help and additional expertise as well. Absolutely. I mean, managing grants once you get them can be a challenge too. So sometimes getting funding for a particular project can help keep that project moving forward. So the advantage you get sometimes isn't just the money, but it's that incentive for the community to buy in and get the project done. So sometimes it's about more than money. As a working mom myself, I'm a huge advocate for childcare in rural communities, and I know what a huge challenge it is, and it really can make or break your community. You got to have housing and you got to have child care. Most households with children are two income households. And so it is absolutely essential to making life possible in these rural communities. That is something that we do have some funding sources available for. We actually helped with 
financing on a project in Hiawatha. Uh, that's been a number of years ago. But it's an area that I'm very interested in. I want to give a shout out actually to the state of Kansas, who has really led the way, I think, in some of these initiatives to help rural communities. The CDBG grant round this year, they have an emphasis on child care. And that is incredible. They understand the significance of that. I think in relation to child care, we might be a little bit behind um, at USDA. There's a rural development title in the farm bill every five years. And so the last farm bill passed in 2018. Child care wasn't mentioned in that farm bill, even though we know it's in many communities their number one issue. So it'll be interesting to see what comes up here in 2023. We would like to help in any way we can. Clearly, we have financing available, but it would be nice to have grant funding as well. If folks are interested in that particular issue, I have some resources, but they should also take a look again at CDBG this year because the state is emphasizing child care as part of that program. And last legislative session, there was a, a bill at the state level that helped fund rural child care as well. So that's something to look at. But I talk to folks every day about this issue. And if it was easy to address, it would have been done by now. But with all of these programs layered, it's certainly possible. And I know in a lot of rural communities, they're partnering with rural school districts to make it happen. I was just visited with someone this morning from Solomon who is working on a child care center uh, right now. They've already broken ground. So Wonderful. there are ways in these communities for folks to work together and pool resources to get it done. And it's absolutely essential. Absolutely. Yeah. Worthwhile effort for sure. And I'll link to all of the resources that you mentioned, Christy, just so listeners can check them out if they would like to. So that will be in the show notes of today's show, which can be found on agtoday.net. But Christy, thank you so much for joining us today. I feel like our conversation was very insightful to know how USDA is helping address some of the needs of especially rural communities across Kansas. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time as well and uh, look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Once again, everyone, that was Kansas State Director for the USDA Rural Development Program, Christy Davis, joining us for a conversation on USDA programs available for rural communities. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are joined now by two K-State guests. We are joined by Chris Mullenix. He's the faculty advisor to the Purebred Beef Unit here at K-State, as well as coach of the Livestock Judging Team. And Shane Work, he is the Purebred Unit Manager. And they're joining us today to talk about the upcoming Legacy Sale, which is taking place March 3rd here at K-State. So, gentlemen, thanks for joining me this morning. Excited to be here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So this legacy sale, the name hints exactly at how long it's really been going, but roughly 38 years now here at K-State? Actually, a little longer than that, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this is our 46th or 47th. We should probably know that yeah. off the top of our head. But 1977. Yeah, it, yep. Wow. So a lot of history that ties into the sale and the origin of it. Why did it get started originally? The current version and is, has been it for several years and folks may be familiar with it. It's a primarily a bull sale. We sell some females as well. But the origin of the sale was actually from a heifer that the purebred unit raised and showed across the country. And she was a what they call a triple crown winning Angus female. They called man Manhattan gal, which have, has happened very few times. And so that kind of spawned the idea of having a, a female sale from the Angus herd. And then they went for a few years where they would rotate breeds having female sales, Angus, Hereford, and Semitals, which are the three breeds we still have today. And then it's kind of over time, it's morphed into more of a bull sale, kind of geared to commercial cattlemen. But of course, we sell some cattle to purebred people as well. So Wonderful. And I understand students play a big role in this sale every year as well. Honestly, I think that's what makes a sale unique. As we go back historically, even to those early sales, one of the very important missions of the sale itself was to have student involvement and engagement in the activity itself. So we teach a class that runs 16 weeks, just like any other class, but kind of overlaps two semesters. So we start the middle of the fall semester and work through the bull sale in March and close up that class mid-spring semester, but 16 weeks that overlap kind of that winter time frame in preparation for the bull sale itself. And, you know, kind of the purpose is to introduce our students to the process of putting on a seed stock event like this. Many of them come from their own production backgrounds, but especially today, we see a lot of students in that class that have a real interest in purebred livestock. 
but maybe no longer are coming from farms and ranches that had their own production sales. So it's really an opportunity for a lot of these students to see it from you know, ground level and learn about all parts of sale management and even putting on the event uh, itself, day of the sale and, and everything that goes into that process. Angie Denton's a big part of that class as well. But one of the neat things that we do is bring in a number of stakeholders of K-State that become part of that class and uh, everything from sales and marketing experts to great breeders that host their own production sales annually to really give our students some insight on what it takes to have a successful sale and not just on sale day, but all the preparation that it takes to make sure you have a great event. So. Absolutely. A unique learning opportunity then for students. One of a kind. I don't know of another university that has anything like that. And it's been something that uh, we've taken a great deal of pride in. And Shane and I were both part of it as students ourselves. So uh, I took bids for Stanley Stout years ago uh, as part of the bull sale. We call it the bull sale class. It has an official name, but I think everybody around uh, the department just calls it bull sale class. So it sounds like all parts of this sale really are tying back into its name legacy here. And you mentioned Stanley Stout there a moment ago. He was a very well-known K-State auctioneer that was a part of this event for very many years. Now his son is going to be the auctioneer this year? Yeah, it's been a few years since since Stanley has passed, but of course the, the building's named for it. And he, he was a big K-State supporter and, and a native Kansan and somebody that was well-known throughout the livestock industry, uh, specifically the, you know, the purebred cattle industry. And when Stanley died, we, uh, you know, we had to obviously keep having a sale. And so we did, and uh, we've had a great auctioneer, Sonny Booth from Oklahoma, that has been really good to us for several years. And uh, he's kind of slowing down a little bit, taking a few less sales. And so, yeah, we're actually going to transition to Justin Stout, uh, Stanley's son. Uh, it's going to be the auctioneer this year. So Again, I, I think it, like you already mentioned, kind of plays to the name of the sale in some ways. And I think anyone that has a history with K-State knows what Stanley meant you know, to this program. The man bled purple for us and Justin is much the same. So we're excited to make that transition and bring him on board. Testament to the close family ties that K-State offers in a lot of various ways, but this program specifically. So now that we've kind of covered the history and how students are involved and the legacy aspect of the sale itself, let's get into the cattle that are available this year. What are some unique features of them this year? Yeah, we've got a really good group of cattle, a nice set of bulls. The top end of our Angus bulls are really strong. And we We've got a, a really nice hometown son that we'll start off our catalog with. Uh, hometown is a bull raised by the gardeners here in Kansas. Of course, uh, also big K-State supporters and supporters for our unit. So he's a really nice bull. We, we did really well with that sire group last year and they sold excellent and and actually select sires a bull stud bought one of those bulls to put into their stud we've got a, a new sire group this year uh sired by db iconic it's a bull that uh gen x cooperative owns and and they're big supporters for us as well but uh those bulls are really good really strong in terms of data good bulls as well in person got a, a good group of semitall bulls and a nice big group of those a few more than we had last year got some older bulls in that group some 18 month old bulls that can go and cover a few more cows on the top end of the spring bulls too a couple bulls that are really good in terms of, of data again and nice bulls as well be a couple maternal brothers to uh, a heifer we sold for twenty thousand a, a few years ago so good strong group there the herefords are really strong as well uh, we have some maternal brothers to a, a bull we called land grant that we sold last year brought forty three thousand to some breeders and uh, st genetics and uh, just uh, uh, an excellent bull there and some good maternal brothers to them that are that are pretty exciting as well and a good group of females as well. We've got some fall bred females. We've got a few uh, bred heifers, semitall bred heifers that are really nice and a good group of Angus cows. And then one thing that I kind of started when I got here, we started selling some spring yearling commercial heifers that were open and they're, they're ready to breed and they got kind of all the work done on them. And they've been really popular. We've done really well with them and, and uh, we've got another good group of those. We'll sell them in groups of three. So we got uh, 21 of those seven groups. So so yeah, good, uh, we're excited about the group of cattle this year. So Wonderful. Land Grant. Love that name. That's a great name for yeah. this sort of sale associated with the original Land Grant University. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So I know you mentioned the catalog there briefly. It's available now online, right? Yep, correct. It's on the, the K-State website, and it's several places. Social media, of course, we have a Facebook page for the Purebred Unit and uh, went to the printer as well. And so, uh, you know, we'll still mail out hard copies as well, obviously. So 
Wonderful. Well, I'll link to all of those resources as well in the show notes of today's show, which can be found on agtoday.net as always. But gentlemen, if we haven't convinced listeners enough already that they should come to the sale this year, again, on March 3rd, what else do you have to share to convince people to come out? Well, I'll echo some of the thoughts that Shane had on the offering. And, you know, the sale itself has such a unique history and what we do with our students is incredible. But it wouldn't mean much if the offering of the cattle didn't give our breeders across the state something to be excited about that can really add something to their breeding program. And, you know, I'll I'll toot Shane's horn for him because I know he won't do it himself, but he and his crew at the Purebred Unit hands down have put together the deepest set of bulls and females for that matter that I think we've had in this sale in a long, long time. And and I think what is unique uh, about the offering is almost regardless of what your program's needs may be, I think there is elite quality but enough diversity in the offering that there's a bull here for every potential purchaser you know whether you have a commercial program a purebred program you know whether you're seeking a you know a heifer safe calving ease kind of bull or you retain ownership in calves you know through a feed yard you know regardless of what you're trying to do or accomplish in your breeding program I think you'll find bulls in all three breeds that can do those things and as part of our teaching to students we find incredible value in and making sure that cattle check a lot of boxes, so to speak. You know, I think if uh, if you were to come here and study feet and leg structure and quality the bulls phenotypically, you're going to be excited. If you turn to their paperwork and you're looking for performance values and data that can really make a difference in, a, in the genetic uh, offering in your next calf crop, then uh, you're going to find that too. And, and I think that's a credit to what our guys at the unit have done because it doesn't happen overnight. You know, these are breeding decisions that were made long ago, you know, to offer yearling and, you know, 18-month-old bulls. So it's exciting to see the fruits of their labor and most importantly to be able to showcase them for our university and for uh, potential buyers out there that really can kind of reap the benefits of what Shane and his group have put together. So not only a great opportunity to visit Manhattan, obviously, but a great opportunity to get your hands on some very well-bred animals that you might need to add to your herd, especially in times like these where genetics are becoming more and more important as we see our herds kind of shrinking in some ways, right? Yeah, I think, you know, what we've learned in 30, 40 years, you know, is uh, the value of understanding genetic potential and what that can do in a breeding program. And and we don't want to, you know, say there's one piece to the puzzle that's more important than anything else. I think that's what each breeder has to determine is, is what things do they value, what things generate profitability in their operation, and come find that bull that makes sense for them or group of females for that matter. You know, and I think, you know, that's the important thing, but without a doubt, you know, is, is what you tell touch on uh, and what we try to talk about with our students is why not take advantage of the technologies that are available to help us make improvement maybe that much quicker. Absolutely. Well, I can't thank you enough, Chris and Shane, for joining me in studio today and looking forward to the legacy sale taking place March 3rd. Great. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Once again, everyone, that was Chris Melanix. He serves as a faculty advisor to the purebred beef unit here at K-State, as well as coach of the livestock judging team. And we also were joined by Shane Work. He is the purebred unit manager here at K-State. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. We end today's program with this week's Milk Lines. Fly season is near, and K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook says it's time to think about control measures. Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning fly control on their dairies. Yes, I know, seems like it's pretty early to be talking about this, but you know, when we get into the um, first part of March to the middle of March, guess what? You're going to see some flies on your dairies. So you need to really think about how you're going to approach it this year. Fly control is really all about controlling the number of larvae that are actually on your dairy. We look at dairies that have excellent fly control. Usually, it is the result of the cleanliness and sanitation that they have around the dairy. Yes, we have all kinds of chemicals that we can utilize. We can use predator insects to try to control the population. But, you know, when it gets down to it, it's just trying to remove all of the breeding areas that we can. So what are the two main breeding areas that you need to be thinking about? Well, one is wasted feed and manure. 
if you also use straw bedding, that would be part of this as well. These are excellent fly breeding grounds. If we remove them from the dairy, flies don't have a place to lay eggs. Larvae don't have a place to develop. Really, really, really important in your overall fly control program. So here's the problem. On many of our dairies, as we go through winter and as we come into early spring, it's been wet, we've had snow, some of the waste feed doesn't necessarily get hauled away as quickly as it normally would. Sometimes we have piles of used bedding that have been piled up when we were just too busy trying to keep animals comfortable to actually get it hauled off, or maybe it was too wet to haul it off. We need to get those areas cleaned up, and we need to do it soon. Because again, flies start laying eggs shortly after you start seeing them. So mid-March, it's going to be time to have those areas cleaned up. Secondly, as you uh, think about waste feed around your farm, many of you feed silage. You scrape off spoiled silage and you put it in piles next to the bunker or the bags as you feed your animals. Great practice. However, that also becomes a fly breeding ground. Again, need to get that cleaned up, hauled out, spread on the fields, however we dispose of that. We need to get that done and we need to get that done soon. Now, once you've removed all the fly breeding grounds that you can, you need to start thinking about, it. well, what are some other things that I can do to control the population? Because really to keep flies under control on your dairy throughout the summer, it's really about controlling the number of adult flies that you have that are laying eggs. So if we remove the places for them to lay eggs, we still have to control some flies because we're not going to get rid of all of them. So how are we going to control those remaining flies? Well, there's lots of different things you can use. Some of you probably have used the predator wasp, and those work great. But again, we got to start putting those out early. So probably need to be thinking about late March, maybe even early April for that type of control program. On other dairies, uh, we tend to use baits. Baits can be very, very effective early in the fly season and actually throughout the fly season, but maybe more so during the early part of the fly season when we don't have as much pressure. And during that time, again, adult flies will find that bait and hopefully we can uh, get them killed before they actually start laying eggs. So again, this is an excellent way to keep that fly population down. May not be able to eliminate it, but really our goal is to basically control it. And we can use baits very effectively to do that, particularly early in the season. Now, as you get deeper in the season, probably going to have to result to uh, some premise sprays as well as things that you might uh, apply to the animals. Again, let's think about the control program now. Let's decide and make a commitment that we're going to try to reduce the fly breeding areas around our dairy as much as possible, that we're going to use baits and other things like predator wasps possibly early in the season, and then we need to have a definite control as to how we're going to spray animals and premises as we get a little deeper into the fly season so that we can keep the fly populations under control as we move through the summer months. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.